money is a very interesting topic that is in everyone's mind. People always say, I want to achieve financial freedom. The key, how are you going to do that? In today's episode, we are so grateful that we have KC Lau with us. KC Lau has authored eight books and also have produced multiples of online courses. This mission for people to achieve their financial independence. In today's session, he's going to share about his personal experience, how he can achieve that and prove anyone like you can do it as well. Alright, and let's dive into KC Lau sharing now. Thanks uh, Billy for your introduction. And thanks everybody for being here in the view deck. I really appreciate your presence here. And in fact, we still have a few seats uh, left. If you have time, please come over because we look better in person. <laughs> Especially Billy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so please come and uh, say hi. So today my topic is actually the same as the book because it's a book sharing club and I'm going to talk a little bit about the ideas that I talk about in my book. So the book is called Money Smart. How to achieve your financial goals faster with less. So I'm going to give you an overview and there'll be a lot of charts during uh, this presentation and uh, stay tuned for that. Don't go away and then if you have any questions along the way, please post in the what do you call it, comment section or something like the chat box. The, and, chat, the yeah. chat, chat box. And then Billy yeah, is going to uh, moderate that. But if you want, if you want your, your questions to be answered with priority, uh, please be present in the view deck. <laughs> they are going to have the more privilege for that. Okay. Can I control the sites? Okay. So you guys can see the screen, right? So it's just some, some, some disclaimer if I, hello. Okay, Great. Yeah. You came because I said that it's better to be here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. So, uh, Today, if I mention any stocks, right, it's just a, uh, it's not a recommendation to buy or sell, right? Just uh, information sharing, and then for mostly for educational purposes. So just my disclaimer, it means that, in short, uh, if you incur any losses or any gain in the future, uh, don't blame me and also don't credit to me. It's fine. It's your decision, right? Okay. Uh, these are my previous book that has been published, uh, quite some times ago. I think my first book came out two thousand eight. It's called Top Money Tips. So uh, these are all out of print already, but I still have a few collectible copies here today at the view deck, right? I think I have three copies of funny money, funny money, and three copies of top money tips. If not, if you want to get these copies, you have to go to eBay already. <laughs> okay, uh, this was when I was still in uh, Malaysia. I do talk uh, for some corporate, so this is the I think the biggest one in the AIA conference. And then, uh, thanks to Intel, okay. Intel offered my wife a job in Oregon, so, <laughs> so I got to move together. So we, we moved to Oregon in 2018. And then uh, subsequently, during 2021, we actually moved to Taipei. Also, thanks to Intel for releasing my wife. So we went to Taipei again, so I, I'm very grateful to have a, such a wonderful human being, being my wife. And uh, no, due to that, I get to travel, right? All for free, right? And then, uh, okay, let's start the content of today. So I think the main story I want to share today is about this car. Uh, anybody can guess here what, what car is this? Anybody? Uh, if, if you're online, you can type in the chat box. I think some of you might have seen this ads before, right? Yeah. You're asking someone to come in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, so this is the advertisement, you know. I record this video and put advertisement on YouTube. So most of you, some people might have watched this before. Uh, anybody of you here in the view deck today, have you watched this? Have you seen this? Yes. Have you seen this? <laughs> So ever since I advertised, I, I've been called a comment, right? <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I never advertised, then nothing happened. So this, I put up this advertisement. Basically, this advertisement is talking about, I, I'm just driving my Mustang. So I'm just talking about, you know, if you are looking for passive income, if you have joined countless money games, MLM program, and you didn't get any result, then you should click my link. I'll tell you why. 
So basically, my ads is just pointing someone to download an ebook. So an ebook is telling you all this thing doesn't work. <laughs> basically, I'm not telling you how to make passive income. I'm just telling you all this doesn't work because the things that really get you passive income, you need hard, hard works, right? It needs capital. If you expect something that you don't work and you get money, it's all bullshit, right? Sorry. Can I say that? <laughs> okay, you blurred that out. Okay. <laughs> all adults, right? <laughs> so I advertise and then, uh, you know, and what happened is that, okay, this, this, is, a, this is a car that I, I enjoy having, but it is very cheap. It is very cheap, I'll tell you. It is expensive in Malaysia. If you buy one, this is called a Mustang. It's 2017 built, year 2017. I bought it uh, one year old. That means second hand. So before I bought it, I think this car was uh, owned by uh, maybe Hertz or, or Avis. You know, it's rented out. So the mileage is high. So it depreciated a lot. So the new one, maybe 35,000, but I bought it 20,000. 20,388 to be exact. Right? And uh, the installments, very 400. Number, very auspicious number as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, this is part of the negotiation, negotiation also because the, the offer price by the car dealer was like 21,000 or something. And I said, I'm a Chinese. You must give me something eight. <laughs> so if you want, we get 20888. Let's say 20388 and we have a deal. <laughs> so we got a deal, 20388. So it was fully loan. I don't have to come up with any money. So I drive the car away. After one month, I start paying $439 a month. So to own this car, I think in Malaysia, it's just like the cost of buying a Vios, right? I think Vios will be something like that, right? 90, 80, 90,000, 100,000, right? And then you pay installment, 1,005, 1,006, uh, but this is for five years. So the story I want to tell is that I actually get to use this car for free. For free. Uh, how, how does that happen? Just because of some financial knowledge. It's not like I have to do extra things, right? Just a little bit of extra things, but I get to use it for free. Basically, I own this car for free. When I sell it, get back all my money. That's it. I don't spend any money on this car. Okay, what happened? Okay, let me tell you. Uh, in, in, in the US, they have this website called Turo. So Turo is like Airbnb, but it is for car. So if you have extra cars, you know, American, they like to buy three or four cars, right? And then but two person using four cars. So some, some of the cars they don't use, right? And you can rent it out. This is like car sharing program. So I rent it out and it was like $83 a day. And I did 38 trips altogether in within like one year and a half or two years like that before I sold this car. And I sold it during uh, COVID when people are not driving and I have two cars in the garage and all people are working from home. So I sold one. So we left one car. Okay, so what happened is that, okay, 20, uh, 2019. So this is the tax I filed for 2019 for renting this car out. So because I rent this car out, I need to pay income tax, right? Because, the, because I make money from this car. Okay, you can look at the figure. The, on the top right is the total money I made from the $83 rented out, $3,784. And of course, that's not the net fee I got because two row, like Airbnb, they get a portion. So two row actually get 1,324. Can you see the number on the left? Uh, on the left in the middle, 1,324, that's for two row. So my net, in fact, is just 2,000 something. Net money come to my hand for 2019. And then you can see a figure there. You say car and truck expenses, which is 4,200 something. So that figure, 4,200, is actually a mileage expense you can claim, which is a standardized for the, you know, the, the federal tax in the US. They say, if you are using this car for business, then you can claim this expense. So that's the figure I claim, right? 4,000. So basically, when I filed the tax, I got 3,700. But after all the expense, you know, all the maintenance, everything, even the interest I paid for the loan, 436. Also, I can deduct. So that, that means the business is losing money. Mm. 
So I lost 2,400, right? During 2019. Okay, this is what happened. Just summarize the details. I need to pay installment 5,200 a year. And the two-row net revenue, I got 2,004. And then I claimed the expense 4,003. Business loss during that full year, 2004. But due to that loss, I was able to save some tax. But it cannot offset any employment tax. But I can offset my other business tax. So I have some other business that's making money. In fact, I'm still doing financial education. So I can actually offset my income from the other business. Okay, good. So I get some tax saving. And then I put the depreciation there. Is, that means the assumption of how much the car depreciates. So it's like 10% a year. Then 2000, right? 2039. Okay. So how do I get to use this car for free? Because of that numbers, right? First one, you see, if I'm buying the car just for my own use, I need to incur this interest. This is money gone, right? Given to the bank, 700. Mm. And then the rest is actually pay down the loan. So my car loan, 20,000, it will be reduced one year by 4,561. Mm. So after that reduction, can we get back that money? 4,500, can we get back that money? Okay, uh, let me put a survey. Okay, no, right. how many say can can get back your money? Four thousand five hundred. Can you get back your money? Or, or you can get back zero. Or you can get back maybe half. What do you think? Half. Ah, yes. Smart, right? Everybody here. <laughs> nice. You are right. We can only get back okay. half. The online people say some people say zero. Uh, some people say zero. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, yes, in fact, we can get back roughly half because what happened is that mm. when you sell the car, people pay you money, right? Then uh, the actual loss I have on the car is actually the depreciation because I cannot sell the car at the same price. I have to sell it lower, mm. lower by 2000 So when I sold that, I actually get back 2500 So my total cost for owning that car, in fact, is like the interest, 700 plus the 2000 2700 so that's the that's the cost i have to bear right if i own that car i use it for that year mm. that's the amount of money i, I have to pay okay. uh, about 10000 ringgit okay but i get to use it for free why okay first thing uh that's a gap right 2700 right okay and then i i got back some cash from turo right 2005 2460 to be exact. I got back from two rows, that money is in my pocket. Right? So, but still, still negative, still negative. It doesn't cover everything. Uh, but here comes the tax saving. So, because of the loss of this business, I pay less tax on the other business. 850. So, basically, it covered everything. Right? Uh, eventually, uh, which is correct, I sold the car 2020, got back my money. And got back the tax saving. And in fact, I got to use the car for free. I even, you know, I'm not like, uh, not counting the, the effect I got from taking that uh, advertisement, you know, shooting that video. <laughs> so people say, oh, I, he probably have rented that car. No, no yes, I rented that car. I rented it out. You know? <laughs> I rent that car to shoot the advertisement. Okay, so very, very simple, but, I, but I'm not a car person. I'm not a car person. I'm okay, definitely okay. Any car, I'm fine. But it's just that in the US, the Mustang is cheap. I just buy one to enjoy. That's it. And then because I rented it out, in 2019, I actually rented out about 60 days. So that's 365 days. So 300 days is my car. 60 days is not my car. Right, somebody, somebody people use it. But what happened during that time when I rented it out? I think I think I did some. I I think I'm happy when I rented to some people, right? There's a there's a son. There was a son who rented my car just for one night, but he's from Oregon. He stayed in Portland. He said, "You're Portland. You have your car. Why you rent my car, right?" So he said he rented it for his father's birthday. So he so his father can you know, just drive to the beach with the uh, car roof, you know, put putting down. So I think I think it, it, it really you know it, it give me an idea. You know? So when I when I went somewhere else, I also rent the cars that I want to drive. 
I, I rent a Camaro before in, in, in uh, Arizona. So I rented Tesla when I go to Hawaii, right? So uh, this is the thing you can try. If you go to US, this, you, this uh, service you can definitely try. Okay, finish about that story. So basically the, you know, the gist of it is that when you have financial knowledge, when you know how tax work, how incomes work, right? Then you can actually make use of your assets. So if you know this, you can still focus on your work, right? You can still focus on your work, build your career, make your money. But when the money is in your hand, if you know how to use it, you can shorten a lot of time. Uh, what time can we shorten? We'll have a chart to talk about that. Okay. Uh, let's, just, let's first study these uh, two, uh, I call money charts. Uh, uh, this is basically the income statement and also the balance sheet where you read on the public listed company. Uh, so it's about the same, but this is on the personal level. Right? On the left, is the cash flow, I call it cash flow statement. So when you have your income coming in on the left, and then you spend, and what is left is the savings, right? So this is the basic financial 101. That means how much you can not spend it all. If you can spend it all, you will never be able to retire, right? This is just simple, plain simple. And then savings, the more you can do, the better your chances to get retired. And then the more you can push up your savings, the shorter it, the times it takes for you to reach your financial freedom. It is very simple, right? That's one of the ingredients. And the second ingredient, you look at the right-hand side, the net worth. Net worth is when you make your money, you, you, you put it into assets, you buy stuff, right? you buy computers, you buy your house, you buy a lot of stuff. A big items will be cars and house, right? Or you do investment. All those are assets, assets on the left side, right? And then sometimes you need to borrow money to buy those stuff, then you incur liability. You use your credit cards, you use your loans, mortgages, car loans, personal loans, all those are on liability sites. And when you deduct all your assets with your liabilities, then you get the equity, which is the net worth, which is actually your money, right? That's the, what is left, your money. And of course, during our productive time, we try to build the net worth as fast as possible, right? So with financial knowledge, then you will be able to build that faster than your peers. So you can see, I bet there are thousands of uh, colleagues here in Intel, right? Some of your colleagues, they, seem, they, they do the same job, but they seem wealthier than you, right? right? Probably they are wealthier than you. Uh, they have more properties or they might have started at a different starting line. Maybe they inherit something. So everybody is different. Uh, anyway, I'm assuming if you all started from zero, if you know how to just to make sure these charts works perfectly, then you will be able to retire. According to my estimation, if you can do it well, usually within 15 years, you can get to your financial freedom. 15 years, that's all it takes, right? I don't know how long have you been working for Intel. If you have been working for Intel for 15 years, if you still haven't feel like you can retire, then you are probably doing not up to the top 5% because if, those who do you know to manage their money well, they are in the top 5%. They can retire within 15 years. So if you're not, then it's fine because 95%. Ma. <laughs> Most people are 95%. Right? It's, it's just human nature, right? Uh, okay, let's next get to the next one. So the previous one is, is mediocre. It's normal. People just manage their money like that. So the next one is like the people who don't know how to manage their money. Right. For those who are making less income, like their income really cannot sustain the expense, uh, those people are in hard position. So I guess people who are working in Intel is not, right? You are well paid. You're definitely well paid in Penang, right? Compared to other places. I know because my wife works here. <laughs> so uh, you shouldn't have the deficit, right? If deficit is when your 
your income is not enough to sustain everything you need to spend on. So then you have deficit. So this, these people will be poor because they will, they will incur more liability, liabilities because you don't have money to spend Then where the money's come from. You have to loan. You have to take loan from other places. So you have more credit card debts, all those, and then your net worth will be negative on the right. So these are the poor people. So of course, I hope everybody's not here, right? Then we are looking, ah, this one. So what my business is doing is actually, I, I, I try to help people to get to this as soon as you can uh, on maximizing the stuff. So of course, you have to maximize your income, right? Have to be good in your career, get your promotion, make more money every year, right? If you can get double digit kind of uh, uh, increment every year, then that's good. And then you spend, don't spend everything. Leave more for savings and investment. So my suggestion is uh, at least, if you can do 30%, in fact, you can do 30% of all the money you make, you can save 30% and you can invest it. You can get to retirement, uh, financial freedom in 15 years. You can do that, 30%. Oh, just look at your, your numbers. And then in the network side, you have to accumulate more assets, less liabilities. And then you build up a network. That's it, very simple, right? Okay, the next one. So uh, let's look at just the orange line. The orange line is, you know, when someone is born, you start spending money. When, when, when you're born, you start spending money, but you're not spending your money. You're spending your parents' money, right? So if the expenses is always there when we are living, right? always there. So until when we come out, then we work, we buy cars, we buy houses, then your expenses go up. The orange line, look at the orange line. Your expenses go up when you get married, when you get child, then up to a point, and they start to come down when you don't help, you no longer need to support your children. Then it's to come down and then it's during retirement, you just spend, right? Spend, uh, depends on how much money you need to spend. So this is like uh, a normal, a normal uh, expenses line. And then for the income, how about the income? The income, you must know that we are not making any income during the learning phase, the A, learning phase. We are not making any income. We start to make the income during the accumulation phase. When you start graduated, come out to work, 20 something, then you start to make your money, right? Every year you try to make more and you try to make more and you try to make more. Make until one day you really, uh, either you are forced to retire, that means you cannot work already, too old, or you lose your job, or you just simply have enough money, then you can decide not to work, right? Then your active income comes down. You can see the straight line comes down. And then, but we still need income because we still, spend money, right? So, so the income have to be passive at that time. So it's all coming from your retirement fund, your EPF, the money you, 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 you save in your stocks, in your properties, your rental income, all those the passive income have to sustain your retirement life. So that's the wealth and finances. So that's the, the least you can do. At least you have to do this, right? Of course, the rich one will be different. Right? The income keeps shifting up, <laughs> never come down. <laughs> Oh, okay. So this is like, at least you have to do this. So let's zoom in. Zoom in at the middle part. So I think most of us are here. We are still making money. We're still making, we still have to spend money. Let's zoom in. So the first thing, unexpected events that you want to prepare for is that unemployment. How about suddenly you lost your income? Uh, you lost your work uh, being laid off. Then your income suddenly come down zero, right? Then you have defi deficit. So that's why, you know, the, the, I think the first advice is usually financial planner will give you, you have to have an emergency fund, <laughs> at least like six months, 12 months. For employee, I think uh, six months is enough. Like when you are, when you out of, you, when you don't have a work, you can, if you can have money to sustain like six months of your expenses, then that's fine because you can find another job. Okay, then how about the other one? Unexpected event, which is illness. Illness, sometimes when you are hit with a critical illness, you have to take a few years off just to, you know, because you cannot work, maybe some people cannot work. And then how about, how about this one? When you have deficit, suddenly your expense 
shoot up because you need more medical fees and then your income drops down. So how do you cover for this? This is, you can only cover this with insurance. Lah. No, using your emergency fund also not enough. So you have to well covered with your insurance. Next, ah, this is the chart I'm talking about. So, very simple, right? You look at the middle line, that's the retirement age. It could be 45, could be some people want to fire, uh, financial independence, retire early, fire, right? Fire, they want to do it at 35, 40. That's the retirement age. So I, I guess usually people will be like 45 to 65. So before the retirement age, that's the accumulation phase, 20 to 50 years of working. So how long do you want to work? Then after that, that's the retirement phase. How long you want to enjoy your money? Right? If you don't plan for that, if you don't strive for that, then uh, you leave it to the government to tell you, lah, or you give it to your employer to tell you. Lah. you know, one day they... One day he decided that you are not valuable to the company anymore, then they lay you off. So, uh, but we want to detect it ourselves, right? When that, that's, that's what my uh, mission, doing financial education, financial literacy, is that you will be able to dictate it. Right? You want to decide when you want to retire. Okay, so you can maximize it, then you can push the retirement age to the left. So how to do that? You see just these three things. The first is the savings rate. Savings rate means how much you can put aside from your money, from the money you make, from the income. Try to do 30%. Uh, if you want to be extreme, you do more than 30%. Uh, but if you're 10% right now, give you a few years, give yourself a few years to push it to 20, 30%. How to do that? You, do, you have increment, you don't increase your lifestyle, that's it. Then you get there. Okay, okay. If you cannot do thirty percent right now, right, just give it one two years, and then income growth. The more money you make, the easier you can get that. That's why you know some profession can can get that easier than than us. Some professional, I think uh, engineer also good. I, I think it's a very good profession. In fact, I regretted not being an engineer <laughs> <laughs> because I look at my wife's career path. Oh, also wonderful. So sometimes I, I sit at home, you know, when my business sales is not good, and I look at her, oh, she's having meeting whole day, just talking, talking, hey, money comes in. <laughs> <laughs> then I cannot, I, if I do talking, talking every day, no sales, no money. <laughs> I have to pay my staff some more. <laughs> so engineer is perfectly fine, right? Perfectly, it's a very good career, right? <laughs> Keep on doing that. And then the third one is the return rate. Return rate means the money you have, how good you are at investing them. For people who don't know how to invest, they fear of losing money, they put it in FD. That's too slow. 3%, too slow. You will never get to retirement. 15 years, cannot. So you have to do better. So some people think, okay, EPF might be the next uh, best thing. Or 5 6% almost guaranteed. Right? 5 6% I would say also quite slow. So to get to retirement within 15 years, you have to do double digit. At least 10% and above. Is it hard to do? It's not hard. In fact, it's not hard. You look at the best, pe best person, best people who can do this are the billionaires. Ah. You look at the billionaires, ah, right? Ah, the billionaires, how they make the money, right? So for those billionaires who, who are self-made, they build a business, they make a lot of money, and they make a lot of money very fast. So the return rate is not double digit, they are like triple digit. <laughs> very fast, like Mark Zuckerberg get to billionaire status 20 over years old, need. right? That's too fast, right? Uh, but the one who really just invests, and make it into billionaire, uh, you can look at Warren Buffett. So Warren Buffett kind of return rate is about 20% a year. Uh, so he's the genius. Uh, uh. He's the A, uh, A, A, A plus plus student. Uh. So he can do 20%, but I'm not asking you to do 20%. You don't have to do that. You just do 10%. 10%. Very, very achievable. So uh, how to do that? Right? Of course, you have to equip yourself. Just like learning to drive. Uh, you have to practice. Have to do it, then the risk will be low. Every day you're on the road driving, then you feel safe, right? But you suddenly, you know, your your your, your you, you ask your daughter to go and drive to the highway, you feel that it's very dangerous because you haven't been driving on 
doesn't have license even. <laughs> so that's uh, so so it's the same thing. For investments, also the same thing. You know? And and investment is simple. Just I just invest in two things. First is property. Property is making a lot of money because of the leverage, because I can borrow at a very low rate. Right? And then second thing is business. All wealth is actually created from business, businesses. Right? So you can either be an entrepreneur yourself, like me, I built my business, my business, but it's still a kachang business, small one. Right? A few staff only. Or you can participate in good business and grow together with them. Like you can grow together with Intel. For the first, uh, I know, I don't know, first thousand, first ten thousand employees with Intel, but grown with Intel, they have been making a lot of money. So to participate in other successful business, very simple. There are so many listed stock in the world, so many good listed companies. So just find a good one, tag along. That's it, and you can become wealthy. You know, just ten percent growth every year. Fifteen years retire. How simple, huh? So it's in fact very simple, uh, uh, but of course, when you go into the details, uh, that's when I have to sell you my courses. Uh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, let's talk about this. Uh, when you have your savings, it's simple. You, you can decide this is your money, you, what you want to do with it, right? If you buy good assets, then you generate income, you appreciate. You buy property, you appreciate. You buy property that can rent out, it gives you rental income. That's it, very simple. Do more of that. You buy stocks that give you dividend, you buy stocks that grow earnings, then you can participate in their growth of earnings. Simple. Buy those good assets. If you, if you buy bad assets, you simply buy bad assets, change bigger cars, right? uh, more vacations, things like that, then the expense goes up and then the asset also depreciates. Because the cars, when you depreciate right, about 10% a year, that's the money you lose. Okay? And then same thing with your time. If you spend your time to do productive activities, how to build your career, you build relationship with your colleagues or some hate hunter, I don't know. <laughs> also can help with your income, right? And then you, if you spend your time uh, building relationship with your family, your friends, or you spend time for your health, you go to gym, or do exercise, then you get good result. If you do unproductive activities, then you give you zero or negative output. And I'll tell you what, uh, the world is quite fair because we, no matter how rich you are, you still have 24 hours a day, that's it. Right? Although we don't know exactly when we will die, but as long as you're productive, that's the time you have, okay? So, oh, it's 45 minutes, right? You want me to keep? Yeah, you, you, you can run and, and conclude this thing. Okay, I'll conclude this. So, for example, John's, expense, uh, John's finances, he made uh, 10,000 income, spent 5,000, saved 5,000. So, over some time, so he, he can actually save off 200,000 already. So, he have 200,000. And he have liability of 150,000. So, he have 50,000 of net worth. Maybe that's the cash. So, if he decided to change to a bigger house, since he had 50,000, he put down payment, buy another house, then the expense goes up from 5,000 shoot up to 8,000. So every month left with 2,000 saving only, right? Before that was 5,000. But the net worth still uh, stay the same. Just the liabilities in increase and the asset increase. You can see the figures. Before that, 200,000. If you buy a house, 300,000, the asset become 500,000 and another 300,000. And the liabilities also uh, increase. But the network still is the same, right? Still the same. But this is the one route he can go. And then the other route is just what? You use your money to buy productive assets that give you rental income. Then it's different. So that if the rental income is 3,000, then the income is actually increased from 10,000 to become 13,000. And the expenses, of course, increase because of the mortgage, 5,000 become 8,000. Savings still the same, you can still save 5,000. Uh, network still the same. But over the years, when the property Give you more rental income and the property appreciate, then you're going to make more money. Right? As simple as that. Okay, so I'll, I'll not talk about this chart. So uh, let me conclude uh, today's sharing is that uh, you can get my book. Uh, so these are some of the ideas I talk about in my books. 
Uh, this is the English version. You can buy from my publisher. This is Shopee link, kcl.com slash money smart. And you can use the promo code, which will expire on 6 February, uh, before 7 February, lah, huh? before 7 February. So it will have give you 18% off. Retail price is 50 ringgit. So 80% off, I think about 42 ringgit. And I have a few copies of this book here. You can buy it for 40, uh, even cheaper from my <laughs> publisher. Okay, just a few. And then this is the Chinese version. A uh, version is the same, exactly the same, but just in Chinese. If you want, if you want to read Chinese, same promo code, uh, different link, kcl.com/msc. Uh, the retail price of this book is actually fifty-five ringgit. So eighteen percent off. You are still going to pay around like forty, uh, forty-five ringgit like that. Uh, but today also same price, forty ringgit. If you buy from me, huh? okay. <laughs> And then uh, if you don't want to buy also, it's fine because I do a lot of free stuff for my followers, right, for my readers. I will give you this ebook, which is free. You can go download kcl.com slash LP or the Chinese version, zh.kcl.com. Uh, just enter your email and then I will send it to you. And then when you download that ebook, uh, promise me just read for 15 minutes. I have a no time wasted guarantee. So if you feel that you learn nothing from that 15 minutes, right? You can email me back with your bank account details. I'll pay you 10 ringgit some more. <laughs> when I don't pay this 10 ringgit, uh, people don't say I'm a con man. <laughs> when I pay this 10 ringgit, people say I'm a scammer. <laughs> but in fact, there are people who have asked this 10 ringgit. Uh, so these are the scammers uh, who ask for me. Uh. I pay. I always pay. I think I pay less than 5% uh, over the years. Uh, this offer has been around for many years. Okay, so spend your time. I, I think it will be beneficial to you. So if you don't want to be my paid customer, it's totally fine. It's okay because I I I life uh, I I I'm doing this. I think doing financial education is a way to solve a lot of social issues in our country. Just imagine if all your friends, all your families are good with money. Will there be any problem or not? If they are good with money, usually no divorce. Ah. Right? So I think I think I'm you know, like a better word, I think I'm doing a service for the country just to uh, have everybody educated about money so we can manage our money well. So I have these three stuff. You can download my ebooks free. And then every week I do webinars uh, sharing like this. Uh, but online, uh, you can you can get the invitation if you are subscribed to my email list. And also I have articles we publish or at least one or two articles a week on my website, kcloud.com. And if you want to learn faster, so sometimes you know when you learn faster, you need more attention and you need more of my time. Then I cannot do it for free already, right? If I do it for free, I it cannot sustain. So I'll be I'll quit this business. So that's how I sustain my business, which with these online personal finance courses. So there are a few of them and you can pick and choose uh, which one you want to learn. Then it will help you to shorten your learning curve. So probably if you learn it yourself, you read your books, mm. uh, it will take some time. It will take three to five years. But if you want to get results, you learn directly from someone who are doing it. Right? So just a personal story. I've been going to the gym for many years. For many years, once a week. And then uh, last year, I started to engage a coach. I pay money to engage a coach. Last time, I think coach is expensive. I don't pay. Right? I think, go to take weight only. Ma. Why you need a coach? <laughs> and then when I started with a coach, after a year, I regretted I didn't get a coach 10 years ago. You know, I wasted a lot of time. All the hour waste in the gym is actually wasted. Well, probably in one hour, you can do this. But without a coach, you can only do this. Or you do the wrong thing then you still have to readjust your body. So it's the same for money, for anything you want to learn. In fact, if you want to learn it fast, you, you see the people who have the result, you just learn directly from him. This is, uh, this is not my words, huh? this is from Charlie Munger. Oh, he just passed away. He said, if you want to learn, right, you have to clone somebody. You find, you find the people you want to be, and then you clone. Huh? Oh, just be like him. Huh? I clone the part, I'll not say exactly the same. I don't do plastic surgery, make the face same. <laughs> but you want to do uh, what, what he has result on, then just uh, try to learn from a mentor. Uh. Just like I think your career also is the same, right? You, you have your mentor. I think my wife also, she, she did very well in her career because of the mentors she has. Not me now, uh, I'm not like a girlfriend. 
<laughs> okay, I think uh, that's all for my sharing today. So this is a link, and then we uh, can do some Q&A. Thanks, Billy. Okay. Um, is it before we continue? Is there any question that we can ask, we can't ask? You can <laughs> ask anything, yes. Okay. Uh, open up for the people here. Any probably you just unshare it so that so you can see the full screen. Uh, open up for the people in, in the view deck. Hi, uh, thanks, Casey Lau, for the sharing. Uh, just one quick question uh, regarding to the car uh, rental out just now, right? Have you uh, accounted in the this uh, maintenance? The car maintenance part, uh, yeah. Mm, yes, yes. The car maintenance part, uh, yes. It is uh, due to the business nature. In fact, I what, what I spend on the car maintenance, right? The real money I spend, uh, I think I changed tire once only. Because I drove that car for about two years, less than two years, in fact. Less than two years I owned it. So I just changed car tire once and then I... I do uh, servicing like uh, oil maybe twice, one year once, so it's very minimum uh. So yes, it's calculated in the accounting when I file taxes. I think the figure comes up to be like a few hundred again. Uh. Casey, let me get one question from the chat, okay, and then we go to the room. Uh, please comment if ASB is a good investment. Another one. The saving 30%, does it include of EPF 11%? I think there's two questions. Okay. Okay, good. So the first one, ESB. Ah, too bad it's not available to all. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe some here can, can get ASB. So ASB, you, you look at their dividend rate, right? Usually now, I think nowadays about around 5% something, I think. Right, because they, they declare a few times. So about 5% something. So it is not great, but nonetheless, almost guarantee, right? That is it, is it fast? I don't think it's fast, it's slow. 5, 6%, I think it is slow. Right, for me, I want to do, when I do investment, I want to do double digit and above. Anything more than 10%. Okay, and do it safely, uh. not speculate, uh, do it safely. It's like, wow, well, if I do this, uh, most certainly I'm going to get 10% and above. So, but ASB, it can be 10% and above when you do ASB financing. That means you borrow money to buy ASB. So banks are willing to lend you money to buy ASB because ASB is very stable, it's like almost guaranteed. So as long as the interest you pay is less than the dividend you get from ASB, then you'll be making a lot of money from there. Because why? Because it's not your money. You don't need your money to start with. Right? You just borrow money and buy. I think from, for Bumiyo Troy, you can do up to 300,000 per person. So if you have spouse, you can do 600,000 already. So 600,000, not your money, but give you money. Infinity return. Right? Uh, that's the thing you can do. ASB, yes, very good. Use the ASB financing. And then you can always terminate it when the interest is higher than your ASB dividend. You can decide because every year, every year they declare. And then the interest also when it fluctuates, when it goes up, then you have to decide lah, huh? if it's going to overshoot your dividend, then you can just liquidate, lah. sell your ASB, pay off the loan, that's it. And then when the interest comes down, you go and borrow again. <laughs> Simple, right? Okay, first one. Can do this one, more than double digit return right? for women to try. The second question, we're going to be the second question, yes. The second is uh, the thirty percent that you mentioned in your yeah. presentation is now. Does it include the EPF of eleven percent? Uh yes. Short answer is yes. Right, of course, for me, uh, for me, it doesn't matter because I'm the employer, ma, <laughs> myself. So for you, yes. For you, it's like how do you calculate, right? When you pay slip, you come in. You can see your gross income, right? And then you deduct your portion of EPF and then the so everything. And that's the net, right? So you 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 do your saving based on your gross income plus the eleven percent from your employer because that money is also your money. 
So that gross income is actually not your gross income. It's, it's actually more. It's actually more. So 11, 11% also not, not actually 11%. It's less than 11% if you calculate from the gross. It's because it's a fee, higher figure, right? Mathematic, right? So I think from your portion and the employer portion added up almost 20% already. So from your net, you do another 10. I don't think it's hard, right? I don't think it's hard for, for Interland. So if you want to base on that, then that 30%, you must know that you cannot touch. You can only touch 30%. 30% is when you buy houses or you have special needs, then you can take the 30% out. But the 70%, you have to wait until 55 years old. So if, uh, what if you want to retire earlier? So that's the question I want to ask you. If you really want to, like, you don't want to work at 40 years old, you don't want to work early, then you cannot touch your EBF money. So you have to plan for that. No? Uh, but if, if you're perfectly fine, want to work until 55, then you can base on that. It's okay. Perfectly fine. Any questions? <laughs> so I repeat your question, right? I repeat your question. Please repeat. Uh, uh, may I know your name? Soyong, right? Uh, Soyong said, uh, cryptocurrency can be invested because it's not taxable. So in fact, in Malaysia, the good thing is a lot of things is not taxable. Uh, capital gain tax, all not taxable. So that's why Bitcoin uh, or the cryptocurrency also not taxable because it's called capital gain. You put money in, you buy, and then you sell. That's the difference you make. That's called capital gain. But tax issue is a, a little bit sensitive. So if you trade every month, let's say you trade the cryptocurrency, you trade it every month, then it's still taxable. It's supposed to be taxable because it's, they said, you are doing this as a business. It's, it's like buying my book and sell it, like the bookstore. You buy a book, you sell, you buy a book, you sell. So each month you sell a lot of books, you make a lot of money, so that's income. You have to declare tax. So if you do that with your cryptocurrency, and you do that often enough, ah, the, the thing is very gray. La, you know? <laughs> How often can, can be considered often, right? So let's say if, if one year you just trade two, three times, then not, la, apparently not. La. But every month you trade like 10 times, 15 times, that sounds like income already, then you have to pay tax. Mm -hmm. That's one issue. Huh? But whether it's going to be taxed or not taxed, also, I don't trade cryptocurrency. Uh, this is my practice. So why? Uh, it's not me saying now, I also listen to the billionaires only. Right? Right. I listen to the billionaires. Uh, what the billionaires, uh, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, you know, most of the rich guys, they say this cryptocurrency, Charlie Munger said it's poison red. Is it poison red? A little bit harsh. Huh? What I will say is that I don't see it as investment because this is something that you buy and then when you sell, you need someone to pay higher price for it. Right? So someone want to buy your stuff at a higher price, that means it is more valuable. So how do you how do you make this thing more valuable? It is only become more valuable. People want it, right? But it doesn't generate income for you. So the thing is, when it doesn't generate income, when you hold it, like gold, you no know, precious gold, precious metals, commodity, if you hold it and then it doesn't produce income, the thing is that we cannot do valuation. How do I know how much this thing is worth? I don't know how to do the valuation, right? For example, this pool table. If every, every time Intellers come and play the pool table, they are going to pay $1. So I can see, okay, how many people play every day? And then how much income you can generate? Then I can pay a price for this pool table, right? So let's say it makes a thousand ringgit a month. Then I think, okay, if I pay, uh, if I pay 12,000, uh, if I pay, uh, let's say 12,000 ringgit, uh, that means I can back, get back my money in one year. So PE ratio one, right? This is a very good investment, better than you buy stocks. You cannot find PE one stocks. 
<laughs> right? So this thing we can do valuation, but the cryptocurrency is very hard. So I don't know, then I just don't touch up. Because what we want, we want the sure way to make money. Right? If you want to buy, you treat it as lottery, then it's okay. Just treat it as lot lottery, buy it with your fund money, that's a, that's a, then that's fine. For the trail, for the speculation, that's okay. Because people still go and buy lottery, right? <laughs> Although the chances are very low. But you, if you treat it like that, then it's fine. But you do it with your fund money, not do it with like your real net worth. I'm not going to buy all, with all my money to the cryptocurrency, I don't do that. I do own some a little bit, but it's just fun money. In fact, I have, in fact, I bought like less than 100 ringgit of Bitcoin, but that was more than 10 years ago. I, I bought it because someone asked me to pay using Bitcoin. I do some graphic design. So I pay that guy, I, I bought some, I bought like less than 100 ringgit of Bitcoin, and then I pay him, and then I still left some. So I left some, I didn't sell. So that Bitcoin become like, I think now about 20,000 or so. <laughs> wow. I still don't believe in it. <laughs> you know, if I think that, wow, now wait, my less than 100 ringgit can become 20,000. But I still haven't sold it, you know, because I think it's a fun money, I just leave it there. So if I'm thinking that, oh, I can become a millionaire just doing this, uh, then I, I probably will sell my house and buy Bitcoin, you know? It's a very, very dangerous thing to do. So please don't do that. If you want to make the money to show me. Can we go to the next question? Yeah, sure. Okay, this is a question from James. Uh, two questions in one, uh, interrelated. How do you balance your portfolio between stocks and properties? What are the risks of being too heavy in property? Mm, good question, good question. In my early days, I'm very heavy in properties. Gone through that cycle. So whenever I have some money, I want to buy properties because, the, because of the leverage. Right? As long as I can borrow money, I want to buy properties. Last time. So now I have a few properties. Huh? I, I pro we, we have properties in US also. We have uh, most properties still in Malaysia. So the things about property is that the danger come when, because when you buy a property, you have commitment, right? Not just the installment. It comes with the repairs, comes with the taxes, everything to own the properties. So those things, if you don't have rental income, it, it is very hard because it's going to take away your cash flow. All your income coming in, your money, you have to sustain that. So it will happen. I'll tell you what, it will happen. Sometimes if you're lucky, it happened for a short time. Maybe your tenant left and then you'll take some time to find another tenant, maybe two, three months, right? If, if you're not a good property investor, then you buy some property and then it's left vacant for many years. Oh, that's very bad. Right? You have to take three, four properties just to cover this property, right? So how to balance that? Uh, I would say it actually depends on your DSR. So how much uh, income you can safely make, then you borrow up to that point. Uh, let's say your DSR, you're comfortable with, because everyone, these are different, right? Because it depends on your spending also, because of how much money you make also. Like for people who are making 100,000 a month, they pay 70,000 in, in loan is okay. Because 30,000 also, they can live comfortably, right? And then they have, when they have 70,000 loan, uh, every month, but their property is not going to be vacant all the time, or every one of it together, unless it's COVID, uh, unless you bought everything just beside KLCC, then it's happened, uh, or Airbnb, then it happened. Uh. Uh, so you have to diversify. Uh. So uh, I think the what I like to do for the balancing part is that now I'm getting older, so I, I like some liquidity. So if you want to balance it out, I think you can also look at your liquidity side. That means if you have your money that you can spend, for the next two, three years in liquid assets. Oh, not in stocks, huh? Because if you're two, three years, if it is in stocks, you don't know because the price fluctuate, you don't want to sell at a loss. Oh, but at the undervalued times. Like during COVID, oh, during March, you don't want to sell in March. <laughs> right, but you want to buy in March. So you leave, you leave in liquidity two, three years, uh, depends on your age, depends on commitment. And then if you have that money, liquid, and then you can buy some properties, and then your DSR is not like super high, then I think it's okay. Just a balancing. Now I'm getting older, I like stocks more. 
because I, when I borrow money also, I cannot borrow for long. And then uh, every property also give you, give you something to work on uh, every year. Uh, sometimes you, you taxes, so definitely you have to pay tax, right? And then tenants, when they left, you have, to, you have to find another one. So every property needs some management. But I like stocks because I like easy life. You know, we, we like to, when you have time, you want to go for a vacation. <laughs> so we want to spend less time on managing a property. So, so that's my practice. I don't guess we can finish all the questions, but I want to open up. Yeah. Okay, we don't think we can finish all the questions. For those that chat, if in the chat, right, please like the question that you want to be asked so that I can prioritize that question. And uh, for the people in the room, in the room. Hi, Gacy. Um, Sangeeta, thanks for your sharing. So just a follow-up question on the property part just now. Um, what is your take on the deals that these days we see where you get a large sum of cash back, right? Would you consider projects like that? And how would you spend that cash back? Mm, okay, good question. Good question. Uh, nowadays, uh, actually quite a good time uh, to buy property, isn't it? Got cash back. Oh. <laughs> oh, last time we were thinking like, which project is, has a lower down payment? Now it's like, okay, which project give the best cash back, right? So, uh, first thing is that you must know whether cashback or not, the property has to be good first, right? The property has to be good. This is must have, must have. Property must, must be good. So how can you confirm the property must be good? The property must be able to generate you income, la, rented income. So you must roughly have a sense of how much yield you can get from that property. How much yield? So simple. You look at the property. You are paying this price. Let's say 500000 i put the figure easy, 1 million. So we are buying this property at 1 million. How much rental can it generate a year? So if you can generate 40,000, 40, then it's 4%, 4 right? Uh, so to me, 4% will be good. Okay, already. 4% 4 means this rental income can already cover my interest on the loan. Interest part, I don't have to worry. And then whatever the appreciation is mine to take. Right? So appreciation is also simple. Property, it will appreciate. Even in remote town, it will appreciate due to inflation. Simple facts. Right? Even the property, that means when you buy a property, you must have people using that property. Lah. If not, then the price might not appreciate. You have to buy the right one. So the appreciation, let's say inflation, 4 5%, that means your property is going to generate 8 9%, correct? 4% rental yield plus your 4% appreciation. So 8% is like very easily achievable. And, and then you are not using your money, right? If you're cash back, you don't use your money anyway. <laughs> you don't use your money. Then when you not using your money, with leverage, how many times the leverage, right? Usually when we borrow 90%, it's one leverage to nine. You put one ringgit, you borrow nine ringgit. But with cash back, you put zero, you borrow 10 ringgit, right? So in this case, the return is going to be exceptional. It's very, very good. As long as the rental incomes come in. Okay, so when you get the cash back, so Cashback is in your hand. So the next question. So assuming the property is good for income, then can buy already. So can buy whether you want to borrow 90% or you, or you have cashback, even borrow 90 percent also get cashback. Uh, then that's better. Lo. It's icing on the cake. Because money in, money in your hand, when you get that money, is your money. Right? And then you owe the bank. But you owe the bank the obligation only. You just have to pay the interest. You pay the instant, they don't catch out you. Right, as long as you pay the installment. So this money, you can, you can see it as your liquidity fund. Or if you have excess of it, you have too much of it, you can invest elsewhere. You can either buy another properties if your DSR is still okay. Or you can uh, see what's the return you can get from your money for this cash. If you don't have anything to do in the short term, even if you put it in your flexi loan, you can still earn the interest rate at least for about 4%, right? 
uh, Casey, you mentioned about DSR a few times in your, would you share like a bit more terms so that people get some idea? Oh yeah, DSR is the debt service ratio. So uh, banks, they calculate uh, based on your net income. So uh, whatever income you use, that is the obligation you need to pay every month. So let's say you pay housing loan, three, four housing loan, added, added together, let's say 5,000. Then you make 10,000. So this is the 5,000 you have to pay, obligation. So this is the DSR, 50%. 5,000 out of 10,000, 50%. So this, this include your, the debt also include other debts. Include your credit cards, minimum payment, 5%. Include your uh, car loan, your personal loan. All those is the DSR. Okay. So a comfortable DSR is about 30%. Comfortable. So what I heard from you, Casey, is that... Uh... You once you make your income versus your expenses, if it's thirty percent, you like very likely to able to continue to get loans yes. from the bank. Yes. Okay. Usually, so, bank they will they they will depends on your income. They will they will set a DSR for your profession. So let's say you're you're working for Intel, your DSR can be higher <laughs> compared to some people who work for smaller companies, right? And then uh then and then uh depends on your income income level also. Hmm. So if your income level is let's say twenty thousand and above, the DSR can up to 70 percent. Bank can loan you up to sixty seventy. Hmm. But if your income level is like three thousand, maybe thirty percent, they 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 kind of like afraid already. They don't want to lend anymore. Uh, let me ask this question that get twelve likes, right? <laughs> uh, ringgit is depreciating. What is your advice if you buy gold and keep? I I don't buy gold. <laughs> Except the jewelry I bought for my wife. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, also not much. <laughs> okay. So uh, to, to, to counter inflation, there are two things you can do. The first is you have to increase your capability. <laughs> that means you have to be more skillful so that you can make more money. That's the, I think that's a very direct way huh, to counter inflation. The second way is to invest. So I mean your money, uh, like ringgit depreciation, then you have to invest to uh, you have to invest some some money overseas. Uh, buy some foreign stocks. Uh. But gold, no, no, I don't buy gold. Any questions in the room? What's the Right amount for retirement. Okay, nice. So of course, this is a very personal uh, number, right? Everybody spend differently. We have different lifestyle. We have different family to take care of. So uh, in Malaysia, if you are still talking about 1 million, I think 1 million is not much already now, right? You can feel it. So uh, my, personal, my personal feeling is that about 10 million will be very comfortable. So for my students also, I sometimes do this kind of survey. People like to say the number around three to eight million. Three to eight million will be quite comfortable. Also depends on your skill as an investor. So if you are very confident to generate 10% return, let's say 10% return a year. So imagine you have 3 million, 10%, 300,000. Right? It's different. So if for person who don't know how to invest, just put in FD, then 3 million become about 100,000 only. A year, about 100,000 only. So he will spend differently from you. So if you are a good investor, I think this is a very good, good skill to have because this will be useful as long as your mind can think because you don't need your hand and your leg to do investment. Right? Buy, sell stocks. Easy, ma. Just make a phone call or just click, 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 and then you can do it. Really. So if you're a good investor, you have this skill, you learn it from a young age, like, like Buffett, or you start investing as a, as a teenager, he can become a billionaire, you know? Now he's worth like more than 100 billion. 100 billion. Every month, passive income about 500 million US dollar. A lot, too much. Right? When we don't have to get to that level. You just get to your 5 million, 10 million, then you, are, then you are set for life in Malaysia. Learn about investment. Yes, very good. 
do double digit kind of return. I uh, go to the next question. Uh, Casey from the uh, online chat. I uh, I think I put this thing in front. Is that beside asking people to 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 buy your books or whatever, uh, give like uh, probably these are very 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 lengthy question, right? So the question goes, how to identify which are uh, potential stocks and what type of property for a good investment? Hmm. Come on to very simple looking at the figures, right? So uh, usually when stocks are just, just talk about stocks, stocks simple. The stocks must have, must make me money, lah. must be making money. So there are, there are like, I think close to 50,000 stocks in the world listed. So in the US, I think about 10,000 stocks. So they, they all publish, publish information for you to, to look at. So just look at their track record. They have to consistently making money and then every year making more. So if you look at this, also about close to 100 company at least. So from there, you can shortlist and then see which one is growing faster. Right? Which one is making money faster every year. Right? And those you can shortlist again, or maybe left with 50 companies. And then you want to buy. Then you want to buy. When you buy, you, you look at which one is selling cheaper. <laughs> so you look at the PE. You know? Look at the PE, okay, okay. I don't want to pay astronomical PE. I don't want to pay triple digit PE. I want to pay maybe 20, 30 PE, then it's, it's fair. Right? Quite simple. Just look at the numbers. Right? And then, uh, and then of course, you have to understand what the business is doing. And uh, for people in Intel, maybe you are you understand semiconductor a lot, right? You understand this business. Then you kind of like know uh, which kind of business, which kind of company is actually doing better compared to their peers. Then you buy their stocks. Huh? Simple. So stocks is quite easy. But if you don't know any stock or you don't want to look at all these numbers, some people just hate numbers. No? They just want, don't want to look at it. Then I give you a stock tips. Huh? Wow, do they got, got stock tips? I just say disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> stocks is very simple. You buy Buffett stocks, ah, Warren Buffett stocks. So Buffett make all his wealth from his stocks, his his company. Oh, so his company is making money every year. So he every year he decide where to put the money. Want to buy bonds or he invest in another company? He do more acquisition. So his result has been phenomenal. And then he doesn't charge you any fees for investing for you. So you can take along being a shareholder. Just buy his stocks. Simple. Okay, 10% return. Very, very easily achievable. Stock tips all. All right. But if you lose money, don't blame Fantastic. me. Earn money, so don't need to treat coffee. Property is simple. <laughs> property, you look at uh, rental yield. Uh, first, you, you have to know. You have to tell, just, just have yourself. You don't talk about the appreciation yet. Don't talk about, wow, this one got potential. Uh, for 10 years, uh, we'll sell this price. Don't look at that first. You look at that. Will people stay there, rent your property? That's it. Simple. This is the first criteria. Look at that. So to for that to happen, usually they have a lot of booster. Lah. They have like let's say MRT. They have highway. Or uh, they the nearby got a lot of shops, a lot of eateries, right? So those kind of place people would like to stay. So and then you you, you try to check the market price and then the rental you you can get is it achieve, is it okay for you or not? If it's like one two percent, then you skip now. You go to the better places. Lah. Like if it's three four percent. I think 4% will be okay. 4% above, excellent. Right? Okay. Thank you, Casey. Any questions? Oh, okay. Uh, how do we assess whether to pay down the loan now or have that extra cash flow and invest elsewhere? Okay, okay. Good. good question. So, when, when you have your money, like extra money, sometimes you get bonus or something, and then do you decide to pay down a loan or not? So it's, it's actually, when I look at this, it's quite simple. We look at the, the cost of the financing. The cost of the financing. That means if you pay down this loan, the money is not no longer with you. So you cannot invest already. So when you invest, you must make more money than the loan to make the investment worthwhile. So it depends on what kind of loan you're paying off. So if you're paying off credit card loan, then, then please go ahead. Because guarantee return. Right? They may charge you 16% above, 16, 17, 18, sometimes 20 something. So that one, you have to pay it off. You have extra money, please pay it off. Confirm return, guarantee. But if you are paying off, let's say mortgage, mortgage, you look at your interest rate. 
how, how much is it? Are you paying 3.5? And 3.5%, I put in SSPM maybe 4%, oh, more than that already. Or I pay extra into my EPF also, get more than that. Right? Or you don't know anything by Berkshire stocks, ah, no? but plus stocks. Then in the long term, you should be able to get more than that. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me get one question from the chat. Uh, is owning a property myself the same as investing in REITs? Oh, it's not different. It's, it's different. So the question is, you buy your property, you directly own the property, right? So, uh, and then you buy REITs, basically you own just a piece of that property, but the, the property is prime. It's good property. And the yield is quite guaranteed because it's, it's rental yield and then they will pay you the rental yield. So you can easily calculate the yield from the REITs. So the yield from the REITs, let's say you can get, uh, usually let's say you can get higher than FD, people will buy already. Most people will buy those REITs already. Five, six percent yields, they will, they will buy the, the stocks already. Mm. So it's okay, perfectly fine also. If you, if you just invest in REITs, you, fit, you just wait for the good time to buy. Like during COVID, stock price down. Right? Then you can buy the same stocks, same REITs, you get the yield of close to 10%. Hmm. Uh, right? You lock your, your yield at that time. So you don't have to buy all the time. Sometimes you just save your bullet. And then you, when it's the right time, you just buy. Uh, hmm. Buffett always says this, it's like playing baseball. Investing is like playing baseball, but baseball, you strike three times, you cannot hit the ball, you're out already. But investing in stocks, no, you, you just wait for the right time. You will sure hit the ball, then you only hit. <laughs> okay? Just be patient. Times will come. Right? So, uh, so REITs is, this is the first thing. So REITs, you can, you can time the market. And then, but you buy the property itself, it gives you, uh, it gives you the other advantage, which is the leverage. You can borrow money to buy. You can use a lot of leverage. One to nine. With cashback, or well, one to infinity. Okay. Right. Uh, Casey, I guess we can get three more questions. Uh, maybe uh, some, anyone from the room? Okay, uh, Eddie. Uh, Eddie. Uh, is INTC inside your uh, portfolio? I... Intel shares. Oh, Intel shares, ITC. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is very sensitive. Huh? <laughs> I, I don't use our own money to buy ITC because my wife's got us. ITC stocks, right? Uh, we sold, uh, to be transparent, uh, we, we sold off uh, uh, gradually. And now we don't have any ITC stock. Okay, just to be transparent. Okay. You were sharing. Um, the next, I uh, let me scroll, scroll. Okay, uh, the next one uh, in the chat is that, do you need to file, file tax return for Malaysia? if you are earning capital gain from the US stock market? Uh, mm, the short answer is no. Uh, the short answer is no. That means uh, because it's not taxable anyway, right? Okay, so, but the, the second uh, part comes in. So tax, it works like this. Tax is works like, you make money, you tell the government, oh, I make this money, I tell him, right? Then he will tax you, la, if whether it's taxable or not. So the second part come in when, Let's say you make this money from all these foreign stocks and then you bring that money coming back. Uh, so far, as of now, still no tax. Mm -hmm. huh? You bring that money coming back and then you buy properties. So you buy properties and then the, the IRB look at you. Hey, why suddenly you got money buy? You declare this kind of income. Well, how come you buy this property? Or you buy this car? Then he'll start to audit you. He want to audit you. He said, okay, hey, you declare this money. Then this is the money you have. How come you can buy this car? Mm. So cannot tell you. Can't tell you, then you have to show them. No? You have to show them, okay, I buy this stock this time, I make this money. This, I make money out, outside Malaysia, it's not taxable. So then you have to have the paper trail to, to show the proof. Then it should be okay. Lah. I actually have a friend who, who faced this problem before. He, he haven't been working in Malaysia all the time. So it's actually science. And then he do some freelance work for for a lot of airlines company, and he, he make a lot of money. Sometimes he make million from a project. So when he make that money, he buy property. So he also bought a few property in Malaysia, KLCC. So when, when you don't declare any income in Malaysia, then you go and come back and borrow the money and buy the properties. Of course, uh, OSDN is going to audit you. La. They're going to ask you where the money come from. So 
so he has to declare uh, because his money is made. Let's say he's made in, in US, you have to pay US taxes. Then you have to show uh, okay, this money I made in US. That's it. Thank you for sharing. Uh, anyone in the room? Yeah. Uh, okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, always got priority. <laughs> uh, so this one not really related to finance. So uh, Casey, you have lived in Oregon and then you moved to Taipei, yes. uh, Taiwan. So which one do you prefer and why? Oh, okay. Ah, why, why not Malaysia? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So I'm I'm kind of blessed now. I, my wife can get some jobs that's overseas and I get to stay overseas. So being a resident there compared to being a tourist is actually different. So we we kind of when you being a resident, you gel in because you pay taxes there, you spend money there, you have bank accounts, credit card, everything. So you know the system. So so far, what I like is that uh, there are things to like in US, and there are things to like in Taipei also. So my preference, uh, personal one, I would prefer Taipei uh, because it's closer to home, and then the services are. Uh, more affordable. I can do a haircut every month. But compared to at the pollen time, I try all the bubbles and ended up probably I should cut my own hair. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that happened. And then you're like, wow, you're paying so much. And then they cut your hair like, oh. then during COVID, my wife cut my hair. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, uh, that's the thing to be like. You know, but, but in the in, in Portland, I, I love the hiking trail also. And then you can buy bigger house, you can buy big car, pay less for it. And then uh, the air quality is nice. And then I do hiking every every week. I do I go out and do hiking. Very nice trail. It's like wow, living is a nice country. But too bad my family is too far away to enjoy it together. <laughs> so we moved to Taiwan, and then Taiwan is. A little bit more uh, congested, uh, but more orderly, and people uh, do things faster. So different thing, uh. So you have to. I think for me, when we move to another place, we try to enjoy what's the best to be offered at that place. Malaysia also nice. When we come back, oh, so many food to try. Right? Let's get the last question, and then we we wrap up, uh, Kisi. Uh, this question is. Why do you not buy gold or invest in gold? So the uh, for gold and for cryptocurrency, uh, for me, it's a it's the same category. Just like the example I say about the pool table, because to pay to pay a price for gold, I must know how much the gold can generate income. So since the gold cannot generate income, it's just metal put in a vault. I don't even see it, right? Unless I'm buying a gold bar. But when I got a gold bar put at my home, I also have to buy a city box. So it actually incur more expenses <laughs> uh, rather than uh, generate income. So I, I don't know how to do evaluation. So I have to speculate. That means if I don't know how to do valuation, I must speculate thinking that in the future, people will pay more money for this gold. People will pay more money for this Bitcoin. People will pay more money for this Ethereum. I must be confident on that. Only then I can put the money in. But compared to other stuff I can buy, I can be certain. I, I have a shop in, in uh, Bayan Baru. I know people will pay more for it after 10 years. It will happen, definitely. But during this time, I still get rental income. It's general income, right? So as long as the rental go up, then people will pay more money for it in the future. So stock also is the same. So that's why since I already run out of money buying stocks and property, I already run out of money. <laughs> no, no more bullet to buy those things. Then why I have to resort to buy other stuff that I have to speculate. So I don't do the speculation. As simple as that. All right. Uh, thanks, Casey. Uh, I think that's question that we can't cover, I would, uh, before I wrap up, is there any way for people to continue to ask you questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, so, yes. Uh, yeah, let's uh, I have uh, webinars every week, so usually we do it on Tuesday. So if you are in my mailing list, I also have a Telegram channel that you can follow. And also you can go to my Facebook page, search for Casey Lau Manis. Uh, by the way, there are a lot of fake pages out there. <laughs> Be careful. 
Uh, mine got 92,000 followers, so it should be correct one. <laughs> and then uh, you follow me and then get on my mailing list. I do this kind of webinar every week. And then during the week, uh, during the time when I'm posting the webinar, I'll be online as well. So you can ask me any question. Mm. But if you want to have personalized uh, consultation, all those, uh, I also don't charge one on one. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. I don't have that kind of service. But I have all the courses. So the courses members, the paid members, they will have priorities. Ah, uh, because uh, mm. usually I would reply that email often. Mm. Alright, this is all the time that we have for today. If you like video like this, remember to subscribe to us and like this video. This is going to bring this video to more people of like-minded just like you and bring the benefit to them. If you like Casey Lau's video, I encourage you to check out Peter's Slim video that I posted over here. I think these two videos will resonate to you. And finally, be a bit kinder to yourself and the people around you and happy learning. Until then, I see you again in the next episode. Bye-bye.